Welcome to the Jungets Games tutorial for Zapotec. In this video, I'll be teaching you the rules to the game as it's being played, and I will be showing a full three-player game today. Now, I do want to ask that if you enjoy this video, that you please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. In addition to that, if you'd like to directly support the channel in the creation of videos just like this one in the future, then please go to jongetsgamescom support. There you'll find a bunch of ways that you can really help things out, and many of them come with perks like watching some videos early and advertisement-free, as well as voting on which of those videos are made. The last thing I'd like to ask is that if while you're watching this, you see a turn that you think we should have done differently, or maybe some part of this game really jumps out to you, then please comment down below and let me know what you think. I love to see that kind of feedback. All right, let's now jump into the game. Out here, we have the game fully set up and ready to play for our three different players. Before I start, I would like to ask that you please turn on the Klingon subtitles, because I might make mistakes as I'm showing you the game, and those will let me put corrections on the screen where you should be able to see them, and I will also put corrections below this video in the top comment. Well, let's start things off with a brief overview of the game. Thematically, it's set in Mesoamerica, and specifically the Valley of Oaxaca, several millennia ago. In that area, at that time, there was a flourishing civilization called Zapotec. In this game, players are going to be cultivating the land in this area. They are also going to be erecting large pyramids in the middle, as well as having their priests perform food sacrifices to the gods. Now, mechanically, the way this game works is we are going to play through five full rounds before we go into final scoring. Now, within each round, we will all start by simultaneously selecting one card from our hand. Once we have done that, we can reveal all of these cards. The numbers on our selected cards will dictate the player order for that round, and then players will go in turn, where they will use the resource depicted on that card for their income, and specifically, they will activate the column or row in their income grid based off of that matching resource. Now, after that, players can perform various capital actions that are over here on the board, and then they can spend their resources to construct buildings on the board. They can place these building tokens down onto spots that they can afford, and in order to do this, every building that they construct is restricted by the card that they played. This one right here says you can only build the red temples throughout this turn, but you could build them anywhere, whereas other icons on the cards will restrict you to specific terrain types as well as various regions of the board. Now, we do have to spend various resources to construct these buildings, and once we do this, we will put the building tiles down onto our income grid, and in the future, when we activate that specific row or column, we will generate one of the resources depicted. This one right here could get you a wood or one priest that you can use for a capital action later on in the game. Once a player has done as much construction as they want, they will potentially score based off of this bonus card that's here in the middle of the table, and finally, they will finish their turn by drawing a new card from this face-up set in the middle to bring their hand size back to full. After each player has taken a turn, the round will come to an end. At that point, the card that was not selected will go over here to be the bonus card for the next round. We will then take all of the cards selected by the players and add those into the tableau, and we will add a random card from the top of this deck, and then play through the next round of the game. Once we've done that five full times, the game will come to an end, and then we can gain extra victory points from a variety of different sources. Now, I know that was a very high-level overview for the game, where I didn't even mention that one of the capital actions involves putting pyramid tokens down onto the board to unlock even more endgame scoring opportunities. And don't worry, I will explain how all of these things work while we are playing the game. On that note, I think it's now time to start playing the game, and for today's tutorial, we are going to play as the blue player down here. So, let's now start the first out of five rounds in the game. As I mentioned in the overview, the first thing that we do for each round of the game is simultaneously have every player select one card from their hand. We have five cards in a three-player game, and I think this is the card that we want to play this round. So we're going to put this face down in front of us, and once all players have made their selection, we can simultaneously reveal these. All right, it looks like we've all made our decisions, so we can flip these cards over. The purple player went with an 18 value card, the orange player went with 17, and we went with a value 11 card. It's worth noting there are no duplicates with these numbers within the overall action deck. Now we can move into the action phase of this round, and the order in which we perform this phase is dictated by the numbers on the cards that we played. Once again, we have 11, orange has 17, and purple has 18, and we start at the lowest number and work up. That means in this first round of the game, we are going to take all of our actions, then orange will take their actions, and finally the purple player will take their actions, after which this first round will end. So, that means we can now take our turn and perform all of our actions for the round. Let's focus on our player board, and in particular on this player aid card. As you can see, it is split into two sections, and we've already performed the top part in a round where we simultaneously played a card. Now, since it's our turn, we will perform these five steps in order before we move on to the next player. 
The first thing that we do is collect income, and this is based off of the basic resource that is printed at the top of the card that we chose. There will always be wood, stone, or bricks showing up there, and we happen to select wood. Now, the way income works is we will look to our income grid, and we will select either the column or the row that is associated with the icon that's on our card. That means we're going to do this one or that one, and we will then get all of the resources that show up in that column or row. Obviously, at the start of the game, we don't have any tiles over here, so it's functionally the same between these two options. So let's say that we pick this row, and then we will generate all of the resources, and that's just going to be one wood resource. We can add that into our supply, and you'll note we started the game with stone, brick, and wood, and these are the three basic resources in the game. After taking our income, we can now perform as many capital actions as we want. There are four of them to choose from, but each one of them requires at least one advanced resource. The advanced resources are priests, coin, and corn, and at the moment we don't have any of those, so I'm just going to skip past this and not perform any of these capital actions. Don't worry, I'll explain what each of these do later on in the tutorial. This means we can move to the third step of our turn, where we can construct as many houses as we want, but all of them must obey our action card. With that in mind, we can come back to this card that we selected. At this point, we've used the number for turn order and this icon on the top for income, and the third important part of this card is the spot in the middle. Now, this is going to show one of nine different building restrictions, and in order to describe those, let's focus out here on the main board. As you can see, the card that we chose shows the hills restriction, so what that means is right now we can only construct into hills. As you can see on the main board, the hills are these gray areas like that, and there are three different types of terrain in the game with hills, forest, and plains. Now those are three of the nine restrictions. The next three involve the three regions of the board. Down here we have the teal Mitla region, in the bottom left we have the yellow Okotlan region, and in the top left we have the blue Etla region. With these three regions in mind, if we look back at our hand of cards, this one is associated with the blue Etla region. So if we had played this instead of the hills, then on this turn, we could only construct in this region over here. Once again, we went with hills, so we can build into all three regions, but we can only go into the hills terrain. The final type of restriction involves the specific buildings themselves. If we look at our hand again, you'll notice this one shows a village. If we had played this one, then we could only construct villages this turn, but they could be from any of the three different terrains, as well as any of the three different regions. Now there are three different types of buildings, with these villages, the red temples, as well as the yellow cornfields. So, those are the nine different building restrictions that can show up on our card, and once again the card that we chose shows hills, so now we can construct as many houses as we want to into any hill areas on the board. So, let's focus back on our area, and specifically look at the top of our player board. This explains the costs to construct all four of the different things we could build. We have cornfields, villages, and temples, as well as a single palace that we can build up to one time throughout the entire game. Now, I'll talk about the palace a little bit more later on in the tutorial, and if we look at these three options, you'll note each one of them costs two of the basic resources. Now we can construct as many buildings as we want to, again, as long as they all go into the hill terrain, and I think we want to start by constructing a village. That is going to cost one wood as well as one brick, and you'll note we still have a stone and a wood left over, so we should be able to build a cornfield later on within this turn. Either way, for the moment, we can spend these resources and now construct a village. We do that by taking a tile from a spot on the board that matches our action card restriction, and we put a house token down on top of that location. Once again, our restriction is hills, and if we look out here, there are one, two, three, four options to choose from, and that's always going to be the case in a three-player game. You'll notice underneath these, it shows you the color of the tile that was put there, but we did shuffle up the tokens that we specifically put onto those spots. You'll also note that some of these are empty. These all say four, so you only use these locations when you're playing a four-player game, and you don't use locations that say three plus if you happen to be playing a two-player game. So we can choose from any of these four villages, and I think we want to take this one right here. So we'll put our house token onto that spot, and then we'll place this village tile down onto our income board. When we do this, it must go into an empty slot on our board, and I think we're going to go over here. Now we did cover up this icon that shows one priest token, so by covering that up, we can take one priest from the supply. When we look at the supply, here are the priests, and I do want to point out that all of the priests, coins, and corn are advanced resources, and they are circular, whereas the stone, brick, and wood are all square-shaped to denote that they are basic resources. Advanced resources are used for capital actions, which I did skip over on our first turn, whereas the basic resources are used for constructing buildings, as well as one of the capital actions. 
So we've successfully constructed that building and we've taken this village tile. And what that means is in the future when we run income on this row or this column, that will generate all of the icons on it, getting a stone basic resource and a coin advanced resource each time. Now at this point, I think we should spend a stone and a wood, and that is exactly what we need in order to build a house on a cornfield spot. So we can place a house down, and once again, it must go into the hill's terrain, and as you can see, there are one, two, three, four options. Now, I think we're going to go right over here, which is right next to our other house, and we didn't need to do that. We could have gone way over to the side, but I thought this was going to be a good spot for us. So we can now take this cornfield tile and place it onto our income grid. When we do that, it must go down onto an empty spot. It's worth noting that once you place one of these tokens down, you can never remove it or move it for the rest of the game. Now, part of me wants to go here in order to get a coin immediately or there to get a corn, but I think we are actually going to go all the way up there. The reason for that is because I think we are highly likely to want to play a brick card on our next turn, and if we did that, we could run income on this row and get a brick, a wood, a corn, a stone, as well as a coin, all for our income. Of course, by placing that there, we are incentivizing ourselves to choose one of these bricks, so we are even more likely to go for that when we get to our next turn. At this point, we could continue to build buildings, but we don't actually have any more advanced resources, so we can't afford to put any more down. That means the construction step of our turn has come to a close, and we can now move on to the fourth step, where we are going to score the current round's bonus card. That bonus card can be found right here in the middle of the board, and during setup we put a random card there. As you can see, this does show hills, and now what we do is we get two victory points for every one of our buildings that matches this criteria out on the board, and that's not necessarily the buildings that we constructed this turn. Now, at this point, we have two of our buildings within the hills, and this is the main reason we decided to play this card this turn, so that means each one of these is going to give us two points, so we're going to score four points right now. This bonus card will change at the end of each round of the game, and obviously that restriction is going to influence where we actually want to build, because we of course want to get those bonus points. Now that the bonus point step of our turn is done, we've reached the fifth and final step, where we have to draw a new card. We are going to take that from these that are face up in the middle of the table, and that will bring us back to our hand size of five. Now when we do this, we can of course keep several things in mind. One is the icon in the top for the income activation. Another thing to consider is the number, if we want to try to go early or late in a future turn order. And then finally, there is that building restriction printed right in the middle of each card. Now with that in mind, I feel like I don't want to take any of these three actually because we already have cards in our hand that match each of those building restrictions. Now we can take this one over here so that we have extra variety in our hand because if we take any of these, that will match up. Although of course the numbers and the income draws on them are different. None of these show brick and obviously we are pretty good at activating brick. So I think with that in mind, we'll just take this one down here so that we increase the variety of options that we have in our hand. Well, that has finished our turn, which means it's now time for the next player in turn order to go. Orange has a 17 on their card, and purple has an 18, so orange is going to go next. Now they start by doing income. They have a brick, so if they choose this column or this row, they are just going to get one brick from the supply. And then after that, they could perform capital actions, but just like us, they don't have any advanced resources to pay for those, so they're going to skip right past those and now construct some buildings. The first one they want to construct is going to be a temple. That is going to cost a brick as well as a stone. And as we can see, their restriction is hillsides, just like us. It's obvious they chose that because of the bonus scoring card in the middle of the table. So they're going to build this into a hillside, and they're going to go up here. They paid to take a temple, so they have to match up with that, and they can add this into their income grid. Just like us, they've decided to cover this spot up, so that's going to get them one priest. And then after that, they are going to spend their wood and their brick in order to construct on a village. They could build on any village in a hillside, and just like us, they're actually going to build in the same area where their first house went down. Again, they didn't need to do that, but for various reasons, they think this is the right thing for them to do. They can place this into their income grid, and they're going to go right over there. After that, they are done constructing buildings, so now they can check to see if they score for the bonus. And just like us, they have two buildings on a hillside, so they are going to get two times two, or two points. Finally, they have to draw a new card, and they are going to take this one here. That has finished their turn, which means it's now time for the purple player to go. They are going to activate their income on wood, so they will gain one wood token. And then after that, just like the rest of us, they won't perform any capital actions because they don't have any advanced resources. This means they can now construct, and they are going to start by building a cornfield. As you can see, their restriction is forest. That means this must go into the forest terrain. 
After considering their options, they're going to take this one here, and they're going to place it onto that spot. So that's going to get them a coin. And then after that, they are going to spend a brick and a wood in order to construct a village once again into forest terrain. Out of all of the options, they've decided to go here, once again clustering up, and you'll see part of the reason why we are doing this clustering soon. They have to place this onto their grid, and they will go there, and that's finished their construction. Now they can check to see if they score any bonus points. But unfortunately for Purple, they don't have any of their buildings on the hillside terrain. That's not surprising, considering they had the restriction of forest. If they had gone with a different restriction, like a region or a specific type of building, they potentially could have gotten points from this. But once again, they decided to go for that forest restriction, and they are going to stick with that. So they score no points, and the final thing they do is draw a new card. As you can see, there's just two options available to them, and you are always going to have one more card out here in the market than the number of players currently playing. Between these two options, it looks like Purple has decided to draw this one, and that will go into their hand. After that, every player has taken their action, so it's now time to reset for the next round of the game. The first thing that we do is we take the card that was not selected over here, and we put it on top of the bonus stack, so that is going to dictate what the bonus will be next turn. As you can see, this is probably the reason why Purple decided to construct both of their buildings over here in the blue Etlon area, because they had control of which of those would score, and they wanted to get the most points they could out of this, and of course, the orange player is pretty happy to see that happen as well. Honestly, the orange player intentionally did not draw that card, hoping it would be the one to stay out here to score for the next round, considering Orange did build twice into that region. So this is obviously not great for us, considering we don't have any buildings in that region at this point, but maybe we'll try to build over there in the next round to score some of these bonus points. After that, we now need to create a new card market for the next round of the game. The way this works is we take all of the cards that were played by players, and then we take the top one from this stack. During setup, you always put four cards here. We then flip all of these up and put them face up on the table. The order of them does not matter. So as you can see, the cards that we use on a turn will then be added into the options that we have to draw in the next turn. And of course, the cards that we played have a possibility of becoming a bonus scoring card for the round after that. Now, I did say that during setup, we put four random cards face down here, and what that means is if when we go to make a new line, there aren't any cards up here, that will signify that we finished five full rounds of the game, and that will be the moment the game ends, and we will then move into final scoring. Now, I'll talk about final scoring a little bit later on, and we are now ready to play the second out of five rounds in the game. The first thing we all have to do is simultaneously select one of the cards in our hand, and obviously we are very incentivized to choose a brick card so we can activate that row right there for income. That means we can select one of these two options, and both of them have very low numbers, which means by going with either of these, we are more likely to be the starting player when we start taking actions. Now the trick here is if we go with either of these, we will be restricted to just constructing that specific type of building. As you can see, the temples cost stone and brick, whereas these villages cost wood and brick. When we look at the income that we would generate from this row, we would be getting one brick as well as a wood and a stone, so that would be enough to make one of these two. But fortunately, there are ways to gain extra basic resources through capital actions, and I am intending to do some of those. With those in mind, I think we're going to select this, and hopefully you'll see why once we actually take our turn. So we can put that face down on the table, and obviously we are only going to be constructing temples later on in this round. All right, we've all made our selections, so we can flip them up. The purple player went with a 19, orange went with 12, and we went with 8. So it looks like it's going to be the same turn order this round. We will go first, then orange, and then finally the purple player. So let's take our turn, and we will start with income. Since we have a brick on our card, that means we could go with this column or that row, and obviously we're going to go with the row. That is going to get us a brick, a wood, and a corn, as well as a stone and a coin. We can place all of that in front of us, and we now have one of each of the three advanced resources, being the coin, the priest, and the corn, and now it's time to take capital actions. Now these require these advanced resources, so with that in mind, let's now perform at least one of those. Once again, there are four different options to choose from, and I think we'll start by taking a trade tile from up here. As you can see, this market is split into three different rows, with level 1 tiles on the top, 2 tiles in the middle, and level 3 tiles at the bottom. In order to buy these tiles, we have to spend coins, and it will cost one coin for the top, then two, and then finally three at the bottom. At the moment, we have just one coin, so I think we should spend this right now in order to purchase one of these three tiles. As you can see, they say one X on them, so as soon as we take it, we immediately flip it over and take all of the resources once, and then we won't get anything else from that trade tile for the rest of the game. Now you do keep those level 1 tiles that you use, because it's possible you might gain extra benefits from having them through various means that I will talk about later. 
Now you do keep these level 1 tiles even though you only use them once, because it's possible you might gain extra points for them at the end of the game, depending on what the end game scoring conditions are. Now with all of that in mind, we can choose one of these three top row options. And considering we can only build temples this turn, and temples cost a brick and a stone, I think this is definitely the one that we should take. This is the big reason why we decided to go with the temple restriction, because I figured we were likely to pick up this tile and get resources to be able to build another temple. So, we can immediately take these associated resources and then flip this down and put it in front of us. And it's important to note that during a player's turn, they can purchase up to one trade tile from each of these rows, so you could buy up to three of them, and of course that would cost six coins total to do that. We're going to refresh all of these spots once our turn is over, so it's easy to tell which row we've purchased from, so that we don't accidentally purchase another one from that row. So, we can put the trade tile in front of us and immediately take those resources, and then flip that tile over. After this, we can take more capital actions if we want to, and specifically, these two are legal for us, whereas this one currently is not. This spot lets you spend a priest as well as potentially some coins in order to perform one of these rituals, but you can never have more rituals performed than you have pyramids out here on the board, and we currently don't have any pyramids, so we can't do that. Now this action over here would let us build a pyramid that would cost one of each basic resource plus a priest, which we could do, but if we did that, we'd only be building one temple this turn instead of two. Now the last option for us right now is the sacrifice track, and in order to do that, you have to send a priest there along with some food that they can sacrifice. Now you can send up to five food, and for every food that you spend, you will move your token up once on this track, and then you gain all of the benefits that you cross on the track when you move. That means right now, if we wanted to, we could spend this priest and one corn, and we would go up once on the track, and we would get this benefit, which would just get us one victory point. Now, obviously, that's not very efficient, because one priest can bring up to five food to sacrifice, and giving up just one isn't that great. If we had two food, that might be worth it, because getting to this spot would get us one basic resource, which we could potentially use later on in this turn, but that is not currently the case. Looking farther up on this track, there are other bonuses. This one right here gives you a permanent benefit of spending one less coin to take level 2 trade tiles for the rest of the game. Normally those cost 2, so once you get to this point for the rest of the game, it only costs 1 coin for the level 2 tiles. Looking at the rest of the track, this spot right here gives you a 2 coin discount for taking level 3 tiles, so once you go up 6 times on this track, every single trade tile is just 1 coin. After that, there are more points, more basic resources, as well as other effects having to do with rituals, and I think I'll talk about these later on when I discuss how rituals work. Now, I don't think we're going to go up this sacrifice track at all. I'd rather hold onto these and do it later on to get at least 2 bumps up on the track when we send a priest over there. So, I think we are done with capital actions, even though technically we could afford to do a couple of them, and now let's construct some buildings. Specifically, we have to construct temples, because that is the restriction that we grabbed, and we need to spend a stone and a brick for each of them, and we are set up to be able to build two of those right now. So, let's start by spending these resources to place our first out of two temples this round. And with this, I think we want to go over there. The reason for that is because the bonus for this round is the Etlin Blue region over here. We will get two points for every one of our houses over there, so by going over there, we get two points, and I think that's a good enough reason to build over there. So we can take this temple tile, and I think we'll place it right over there, so in the future, if we do a stone income, we will get those benefits, and we've also increased the benefits for going with a wood income option. After that, let's spend another stone and brick to construct yet another temple. And I think let's once again come to the Blue Etlin region in order to get those extra two points. Now, I think we want to take this tile instead of that one, so we can place this onto our board. And let's go ahead and put it right over there, so that if we perform a brick income activation, we will get seven overall resources. Well, at this point, we have no more construction that we can do, so it's time to score some bonus points. And once again, in this round, we will get two points for every one of our buildings in the blue Etlin region. We have two buildings, so we're going to get four points, which is going to bring us up to eight. The final thing we have to do is draw a card, and on top of considering the various restrictions, income, and turn order number on those cards, we also have to keep in mind that the final card not chosen is going to be the bonus card for the next round. Now we know that we have two buildings already constructed in the hillside, and there are two hillside cards out here, so I feel like we should not take either of these so that we can increase the odds that one of them will be the final card so that we can get extra bonus points for them on the next turn of the game because we've already built buildings into that terrain. With that in mind, I figure we should take one of these two, and if we took this one, then there is a chance that the forest card will be the final one, and we do have one building in forest, so that would get us a couple of points, which is, I guess, two less than a hillside, but we can also tell that the purple player is going to be the last to pick, and if they have a choice between the hillside and the forest, they are definitely going to go with the forest. 
Now, it's possible the orange player might not give them that option. Orange might just take this, leaving the purple player with two hillside options. Either way, I think I like leaving that option out there, so I think we will take this card and add that into our hand. All right, our turn is done, and the next number is 12, so that means Orange can take their turn. Of course, before they take their turn, we do have to refresh the market. Now the Orange player can take their income. They have selected stone, and when they go for this column, that's going to get them two stone, a brick, a priest, as well as a coin. After that, they can perform capital actions, and they're going to start by spending their coin to take a level 1 trade tile. In particular, they like the look of this one that just came out. That is going to get them a wood as well as a brick immediately. After that, Orange has now decided, for the first time in the game, to start constructing a pyramid. As you can see, the cost for that is a brick, a wood, a stone, as well as one priest. And then once they pay that, they can put a pyramid piece down onto the board. The Orange player can afford this. And now they can place one of their pyramid pieces down. Now, whenever you do this, you can either start a new pyramid or add on to a previous pyramid, although at this point there are no pyramids started, so Orange must start a new pyramid. When starting a new pyramid, you must take the largest piece that you have, and as you can see, all players have a single large piece, two of the middle pieces, and three of the small top pieces for the pyramids. So Orange must take this large piece and place it down onto the board and they have to put this down onto a pyramid location that is valid for this player count. As you can see, in a three-player game, these three are open, and we cannot place over here, and if it was a two-player game, then only these two pyramid spots would be available. After that, whenever a player starts a new pyramid, they must choose one of these scoring tiles to place underneath it. As you can see, in a three-player game, we had four of these randomly chosen at the start of the game, and these are associated with the nine different area restrictions that we've seen on our action cards. In this case, the orange player has decided they would like to take this restriction, which is associated with the blue Etlin region in the top left of the map, and they're going to put this right over there. Now what that means is at the end of the game, the orange player is going to gain one victory point for every one of their houses within that specific region for each of their pieces in this pyramid. Currently, the orange player has two buildings within that specific restriction, so that just got them two points at the end of the game. Now, in the future, if Orange wanted to spend a brick, a wood, a stone, and a priest again, they could put another one of their pieces on top of that, and you score for this condition for every single piece you have on the pyramid. So by doing that, they now score two points for every one of their buildings in this overall region. Now, speaking of placing more pyramid pieces down, in the future, if the Orange player wanted to, they could start a new pyramid if there was an open pyramid space available. Once again, when you start a pyramid, you have to place your largest piece down. So that means if the orange player started another one, their largest piece is a size 2, so that would go right over there. They would then put a scoring tile on the spot, and that means this pyramid is not going to get as big as this one potentially could. The reason for that is because when you build on top of a pyramid, you must put the next exact piece on top of it. So that means a medium piece has to go onto a large, and a small piece has to go on top of a medium. That means potentially, if the orange player once again builds a pyramid before anyone else has, and all of these were gone, let's say, then you might start a pyramid with your largest piece being the small one, and that is simply a pyramid that immediately completes itself because no player can place on top of a small piece. Now, players are allowed to construct their pyramid pieces on top of other players' pieces, and there is no penalty or restriction for doing that. So if the purple player wanted to construct a pyramid and add to this spot, they would simply take their medium piece and place it on top like that. The final thing to say about pyramids involves more endgame scoring. Once again, at the end of the game, every single pyramid piece is going to score one point for each of the applicable buildings to that restriction, but then if a pyramid is completed, then every player will get five points for each piece they have in that pyramid. A pyramid is completed if no other pieces can be placed on top of it. So this pyramid is currently not completed, but if Orange came along and did that, then this would be a completed pyramid, and at the end of the game, Orange would get five points for every single one of their pieces in this completed pyramid, so that would be 10 points, and the purple player would get 5 for their pieces, so in that case they would get 5. Now this means if a player is able to start a pyramid with a level 1 because that is their largest, then that's automatically completed, and it's worth 5 points to you at the end of the game, in addition to the points you get for the scoring tile that you place underneath it. Well, at this point, it's still the orange player's turn, and they are not done with capital actions because now they would like to perform the ritual action up here. The way this works is they have to spend one priest as well as one coin for every ritual token on the ritual card they would like to play onto. Now, the orange player is the first player to play onto any of those cards, so currently there are none of those tokens, which means they don't have to spend any coins, and this is just going to cost them one priest. Now, they can take one of their ritual tokens and place it on top of a ritual card. 
When we focus over here, you'll notice three of these ritual cards, and we randomly shuffled a larger deck of these and put three of them out at the start of the game. Now, Orange has decided that they would like to place on this card right over here, and that means at the end of the game, this scoring condition is going to activate. Now, you can never have more ritual tokens over here than you have pyramid pieces already out here on the board, so that's why Orange had to wait until they had this pyramid piece out to place that ritual token down, and if they want to place another one of these down, they will need to get another pyramid piece placed. Each player can never put more than one token on a card, so every player can only perform up to three rituals over the course of the entire game. So let's focus over here on this ritual card that Orange just enabled. That says at the end of the game, they will get six victory points for every set of three buildings with the same region and different types. Since Orange placed this here, Orange is now definitely going to try to have all three of the different building types within these regions, because every time they do that, they will get six victory points once the game is over. Now we do draw three of these randomly at the start of the game, and this one right here says at the end of the game you get one point for every level one trade tile you have, two points for every level two, and three points for every level three trade tile. So with that in mind, we might want to go over there considering we've already taken a level one trade tile, and we could gain an extra point for it if we do enable this ritual for ourselves. The final one that we have for this game is up here, and you simply get one victory point for each step you've gone up on this sacrifice track. Now before we move on, I did say that I would explain these icons on the sacrifice track once we were talking about rituals, and the first one is this. That says that whenever you perform a ritual action, you can do so without spending the priest, but you do have to spend gold coins if there are other ritual tokens already on those cards. The last one is this, and once you get your sacrifice token up to that spot, you can immediately place one of your ritual tokens down onto any of these rituals. It doesn't matter how many of those tokens are down, and it also doesn't matter how many pyramid pieces you have, even if you haven't built any pyramid pieces at that point in the game. This is a one-time use ability, and obviously that could be worth a bunch of victory points. Well, Orange is now done with capital actions. They did it three of them on this turn. Now they can construct buildings, and they currently have a stone and a brick, so they can use that to construct a temple, and they are going to do that. Of course, their restriction is they must place that temple into a forest area. They would of course love to build this over in the Blue Etlin region, but as you can see in the forest, there are no more temple options, so they can't build onto that spot. Instead, they've decided to go down over here to this Teal Meatla region, and they are going to take this temple here. They have to add this onto their board, and they're going to put it over there. You might think that they should have put it here, but maybe they don't have any stone cards in their hand in order to actually activate those on their next turn. So by going over there, it seems like they are telegraphing they are more likely to play a brick card on their next turn. After that, Orange can score for the bonus card. They have two buildings in that specific region, so that is going to get them four points, bringing them up to eight. Finally, they have to draw a card, and they are going to take this one. So when the purple player draws a card, no matter what, the hillside is going to be the bonus for the next round of the game. Well, the purple player can now go, and of course this trade tile needs to be refreshed. And now they can take income. In this case, they selected brick, and they're going to go with this column. That's going to get them two brick, a stone, as well as a corn, and one coin. Now they can perform capital actions, and they are going to start by spending two of their coins in order to purchase a level two trade tile. When we focus on these options, you'll notice these have a little one arrow in the corner. That means that these tiles can be used once per round, so if they purchase this, they could use it and flip it over, and then refresh it back to its regular side on the next round, and since this is the second out of five rounds, if they purchase one of these, they will have the option of using it four times throughout the game. Now, every one of the level twos can be used every round, whereas every level one is a one-time use. And then there are the level threes, which are more expensive, and they have a variety of options. They have some that are a one-shot, like this, since you immediately spend two corn, and then you go up four times on the sacrifice track. Once again, you only get to use that once, though. Next up, there is this option, which you can use once per turn, and you can spend a wood in order to construct a building down into a forest area. And it's important to note that this action does not necessarily follow the restriction of the action card you played. So that could be a very efficient way to play a building in an area that you would normally not be able to on that turn. Now the last option are these here in the third stack, which have an ongoing effect for the rest of the game. This says for the rest of the game, whenever you construct a village, you do not have to spend the brick to do so. Of course, since this is not an activatable ability, you do still have to follow the restriction on your action card. Well, the purple player spent two coins, so they can purchase one of these, and they are going to go with this one here, and that lets them spend a brick to get two corn once per turn. You can activate these at any time during your turn, and they've decided to do so now. So they're going to spend one brick, and then immediately get two more corn from the bank. 
That's going to bring them to three total, and now they are done with their capital actions. This means they can construct buildings, and they only have enough to build one, and that is going to be a temple. We can see that this can only be constructed into the blue Etla region. So far, this region has been very popular in the game. In fact, there is only one temple option left, and that is the one that Purple is going to take. They have to place this onto their board, and they are going to go right over there. All right, that's finished their construction, so now they can score the bonus card. Once again, that is associated with the blue Etla region, and Purple has three buildings over there, so that is going to get them six points, which brings them up to six total. Finally, Purple has to draw a card, and they're going to go with this one. It does have a higher number, but it has a brick for the income activation instead of wood, and Purple has three tiles in a brick income activation, which is probably why they're choosing this one instead of that one. With Purple's turn ending, we can now refresh the tile market. The next level two says you can spend a wood to get two corn. After that, we have now all finished our turns, so we can reset for the third round of the game. The first thing that we do is we place this over here for the bonus card, so that means much like the first round, in the third round we are going to get two points for every one of our buildings in the hillside terrain. After that, we need to make a new card market, so we can take all of these cards that we played, along with this one from the draw deck, and these will be our card draw options for the next round of the game. Well, it's once again time for us to all simultaneously choose which action card we want for this round. Now, we still really want to play a brick, I think, and we only have one of those in our hand, so I think we're going to go for it. I don't really mind the restriction of having to play villages down. The bonus for the current round involves getting two points for every house that we have on a hillside, and there are currently a couple of villages that we could build on the hillside out there on the board still. Also, this has a value 6 on it, so we are pretty likely to go first, although it's possible one of our opponents could play a card that has a value of less than 6. It looks like we've all made our decisions, although before I flip these over, I'm going to cheat a little bit for the orange player. I was not thinking their plans all the way through when I placed this down, and realistically, I very much should have put it there. So let's just pretend orange put this over here, and that does mean that right now they should have an extra coin, and that also means that this tile should have been placed right over there. After cheating, we can say that this is what the orange player did on their last turn, and now we can flip these cards over. Orange chose a card value 27, and the purple player went with 24. Now we have 6, so that means we are going to go first, then the purple player will go, and then the orange player will take the third turn of this round. Let's start things off with income. We have brick showing here, so we are going to activate this row. That's going to get us one brick, two wood, a stone, as well as a corn, a priest, and a coin. Seven resources is a great haul for our income. After that, we can now take capital actions, and I think let's spend this coin to take another one of these level one trade tiles. In particular, I would like another corn, and we have two options available. Right now we have three wood and just one brick in our area, so I think this one is going to be better for us. So we can take this and immediately use it. That's going to get us one brick as well as one corn. So we can add those to our large pile of resources, and now I think let's do a sacrifice action. We have to deliver the food that we're sacrificing with a priest. And once again, we can spend up to five corn, and for every corn that we sacrifice, we will go up once on this track. So we're sacrificing three corn, and that means we will go up here and get a victory point, then here and take one basic resource, and then here for our third bump, and for the rest of the game, we can purchase those at level two trade tiles for one coin less. So let's take a point as well as one basic resource, which means we are up to nine points, and I think the resource that we want is going to be a brick. We can add that right over here, and if we were to move to the construction phase, we can only construct villages, remember, and those cost a wood and a brick. Now at the moment we have three wood and two brick, which means if we reserved these to construct two villages, we would have this stuff left over. Now we can't actually do much with this on this turn, and another option is we could spend this brick, that stone, and a wood along with this priest to start contributing to a pyramid, but then we would only have enough to construct one village on this turn. Constructing two villages does sound fun because we get to put more tokens down here and increase our options of getting huge income, but I think this turn should probably be one where we do a little bit of both and make one village and also start our own pyramid. I suppose we could of course join in on a pyramid that's already been started, and in either case, that's going to cost one of each basic resource, along with one priest, and I think we should do this. So let's focus out on the board. Now, if we added to this pyramid, then that would get us one point for every building that we have in the blue Etlin area, and we do currently have two of those. Now, another option is we could start our own pyramid and then use one of these scoring conditions. This one is for the plains, this one is for forests, and that one is for the entire Teal Mitla region. 
Now we are planning on constructing one village this turn, and we could do that over here in the Meat Love region, and there are also a couple of villages over here in the Etlin area that we could go for. But there are no villages on the hillside area of the Etlin region, and down here there is. That's important because the bonus for this round is hillside scoring. So I think with that in mind, let's start our own pyramid. This is the largest base that we currently have available. And now we can choose one of these. Currently, we have one building built onto the plains, and that's over here. We have one building built into the forest, and that's there. And then we have a couple of buildings over here in the Meat Love region. And we're planning on building another one, so I think that is going to be probably the obvious choice for us. So we'll put this right over here, and now that is going to score us one point for every building that we have in this region at the end of the game. It's interesting that the two scoring tiles taken so far have been associated with regions because, of course, these scoring tiles can be associated with any of the nine different restrictions that we see. And in this random setup, we didn't actually have any scoring tile options that are associated with the three building types. When we look at the scoring tiles that were not chosen this game, you can see all of the other types. There is just one for each of the nine restrictions that can show up over there each time you play. Now that we have a pyramid, we could do a ritual, but unfortunately we don't have any more priests, so we're going to have to put off doing that action until later on in the game. At this point, I think we are done with capital actions, so now it's time to construct. We can only make villages, and those cost a wood and a brick, so let's construct on a village token anywhere on the board. I think our decision is pretty straightforward. We want to go over there. That is in the hillside, so we will score more points in this round, and that is also another building in this region, which we will now score one point for at the end of the game, and we could score even more points for those if we put more of our pyramid pieces on top of this. Technically, we could put all three pieces down, which would get us three points for each of these buildings, and if we did that, that would complete the pyramid, and each of those pieces would be worth five points. Of course, putting three pieces down is quite a bit of work for us, and it's possible our opponents might come in and put one of their pieces down, which will help with completion, but also stop the number of points that we could get by continuing to stack up on that condition. Either way, we can now take this tile, and we now have to place this onto our board, and considering two out of the four cards that we have in our hand are associated with stone, I think let's just place it over here, so that if we want to, we could play one of those to activate this income and get seven resources, much like we did on this turn, although obviously that is a slightly different makeup of resources there. Well, that's finished our construction, although before we move on, I think it's now time to talk about this palace token that we have. I mentioned at the beginning of the tutorial that each player can construct up to one palace throughout the game, and the cost for that is one of each basic resource, which is a wood, a clay, and a stone. When you build the palace, you must still place it down onto a spot that matches the restriction on your action card, and you do also take a building tile from your supply. For example, let's pretend like we are now building this palace, so obviously that would have cost a wood, a stone, and a brick. Now the restriction that we have on this turn is building on a village spot, so we could go anywhere on the board that has a village token, and let's say that maybe we go onto this spot right over here. Now the way this works is you take that tile as normal, and you put the house down on top of it, and then you actually put this palace, and you put that on that location as well. So this is a palace location, and then you take this tile, you flip it over, and then you put it face down on top of the palace location on your board. Now on one hand, that might not seem great because you're not adding that down to your income grid, but the reason you want to put palaces out is because for all intents and purposes, that palace counts as two buildings. That could be for bonus card scoring in the middle of the round, as well as endgame scoring for the pyramids that you've constructed, as well as the rituals that you've performed throughout the game. The specific building type can be important, which is why you have this over here to remind yourself that this palace is technically two villages. It's also technically two houses in the forest, and it's two houses in the Meatlaw region of the board. Once again, each player can only do this at most one time per game. Well, we are now done with construction, so now we can score the bonus card. That's going to get us two points for every building that we have in a hillside area, and we have one, two, three. So that's going to get us six points, which brings us from nine up to 15. After that, we have to draw a card, and I don't think we want this one here. We can, at a glance, easily see that we have built two temples, orange has built two, and purple has built one, so that means if this was to become a bonus, we are in a position to potentially get as many points as our opponents, if not slightly less. If we take that, then we leave two forests as an option, as well as the Etla area, and the purple player has a one-building advantage for all of us on all three of those. Honestly, I think we should probably just take a forest. Our pyramid is now motivating us to build buildings into this region. 
And as you can see, there are three four spots left available. There's a whole bunch for the planes, but there are no planes restriction cards out here. So I figure we will take this one. It has a lower value than that one, and it also does a stone income, which is about the same as our clay income. The mixture that we get from those is different, I suppose. Actually, if we look at our hand, we already have two stone and two wood, but no clay. So perhaps that is wrong. Let's go for this one. It does have a higher number, but having the option of running the clay income instead of stone is probably going to be good for us as we make our decisions later on in the game. Well, that's finished our turn, and now the purple player gets to go because their card is the next lowest. Before they take their turn, we do need a new trade tile. That one simply gives you a brick as well as a stone. After that, purple is going to run their income. They are going to activate on bricks, and that is going to get them two bricks, two stone, a coin, a corn, as well as a priest. They can add all of that into their supply, and they now have four corn in their area. Technically, at the start of this round, this should have been flipped over. I just forgot to say that. And now, if they want, they can use this, and they are going to. That is going to cost them one of their bricks, and it is going to get them two more corn. This means they have a whopping six corn in front of them, and we are not surprised to see them do the sacrifice capital action. They can send a priest over there along with up to five food, and they are going to send five of this. They actually have one left over that they could use later on in the game if they want. Because they are sacrificing five food, that is going to move their marker up five times. This is going to get them one point. That will get them a basic resource of their choice. This gives them a discount of one coin for those level two trade tiles for the rest of the game. Then this will get them two more points, and then the fifth move will get them there, getting them yet another basic resource. So, all told, they got three points, which brings them up to nine. They also have this discount going for the rest of the game, and they can take two basic resources of their choice. After thinking through their options, they are going to take a wood for both of these. It didn't need to be the same, but they felt that this was going to work the best for their plans. After that, they are going to buy a market tile. They have one coin, but with it, they are going to buy a level two tile. Normally, these cost two coins, but they have reached the one coin discount spot on the sacrifice track. So by spending one coin, they can purchase a level one or a level two. And they've decided to buy this level two. That says that once per turn, they can spend one wood to get two brick. After that, I don't think anyone's surprised to see them use it. They can spend this wood right here to gain two bricks from the supply. And then once that is done, they've decided they are done with capital actions. It's now time for them to construct, and it appears they are hoping to construct three different buildings. The first one is going to be a temple. As you can see, those do cost a stone as well as a brick. And their restriction for the round says they can only build it down here. Now, they've decided to go onto this spot, which isn't too surprising. The bonus card is associated with hillsides, so they can take this temple. And they've decided to put it right over here. That's going to cover up a corn spot, so they can take another corn from the supply. And now they are going to construct another temple. Once again, this must go into the teal meat love region. And with that restriction in mind, there are only two options available. Between these two, they've decided to go for this one. And they've decided to place that here on their income board. After that, they are going to construct again. This time they have a brick and a wood. So that will let them construct a village in the teal meat law region. When they focus back over here, there are only two options for that, and they are going to take this one. It appears that they are setting themselves up to potentially go for some forest scoring. There is indeed a forest scoring option for a new pyramid that could be built. So potentially that's something that Purple is angling for, although of course they did not construct any pyramid pieces on this turn. They have to place this onto their board, and they will put it here. So after three out of the five rounds, they filled in two-thirds of their income grid. At this point, they are done constructing, and they just have two corn left over, and considering they have this, they are certainly going to be angling to do another large sacrifice action during the next round of the game. Well, it's now time for them to score the bonus card, and once again, that will score two points for every building in a hillside area. For the purple player, they have just two of them. They were hoping to build more, but we took our turn before them and took up one of those spaces. So purple is going to get four points, which brings them from nine up to thirteen. Finally, Purple has to draw one of these cards, and they are going to take this one into their hand. Well, Purple is done, so we can bring out another one of these trade tiles. That one lets you turn a stone into two wood. After that, it's time for the orange player to take their turn. The first thing they have to do is run income. They have wood showing, and they'll perform income on this row. So, it's going to get them a wood, a brick, a priest, as well as a stone, and a coin. They can add that to the coin that they already had, and now they can perform capital actions if they want. The first thing they want to do is spend two coins to take a level two trade tile. 
and they're going to take this one, which will let them turn a wood into two corn once per round. They're going to immediately use that, so this wood will turn into two corn, and then they're going to use their one priest to sacrifice both of these corn. Two corn moves them up twice, so they will get one victory point as well as one basic resource of their choice. The victory point will bring them to nine, and then they're going to take a wood resource. After that, they are done with capital actions, and for construction, they are going to build a single temple. Just like the purple player, they have a restriction forcing them to build into the teal Mitla region. When they focus over here, there is only a single temple left in that entire region, so they are going to build there, and then they can place this onto their board, and instead of making a full row of three, they're going to go down here. They don't think they need lots of priests like that, and getting the extra resource is nice, but they also like the idea of getting an extra corn to do another larger sacrifice action during the next round of the game. So they can take one corn for that. And now they are done constructing. At this point, they can score for the bonus card. And they have two buildings in hillside terrain, so that is going to get them four points, bringing them up to 13. Finally, they can draw a card, and whichever one they don't take will be the bonus card for the next round. Orange has a single building in the forest, whereas they have three temples, so with that in mind, they are going to take this forest card to make this temple the bonus for the next round. The purple player is certainly not unhappy about that. They also have three temples, and we have two, so it's not terrible for us. And obviously, the orange player is going to get more points for that one being the card instead of this one here. This card will go into their hand, and that is going to finish the round. Now that means we can draw another trade tile for the market. This one lets you turn a brick into a priest. And now all of the level 2 trade tiles can refresh for each player, and we can build the card row for the next round. We can draw a random card from the top, and then put all of these cards that we played out here as options. Well, at this point we are ready for the fourth round of the game, but I think at this point let's pause playing the game and to describe how we actually score points once the game is over. Remember, the game will end once we complete five full rounds, and so far we've seen three out of those five. Obviously, as we get more of these tiles onto our income grids and get more of these various market tiles, we get stronger and stronger so that we can do more and more things on each of the game's very few turns. Once the game is over, we will gain extra endgame victory points from the sacrifice track, from the ritual cards, and from the pyramids over here. When we focus on the sacrifice track, you can see the player who is farthest up will get 9 points, second farthest will get 6, and third farthest will get 3. And if there is a tie, then the player whose token is underneath other tokens on that spot is going to break it in their favor. So in this case, purple would be breaking the tie and they would get 9 points, and we would be in second place getting 6. After that, every player is going to score for all of the rituals that they've activated. At this point in the game, only the orange player has done that, but I'm sure in the final two rounds of the game, multiple of these would be taken by various players. I've already described the conditions for each of these, and of course, once you put these tokens down, you can play towards those, and the sooner you put these down, the more costly it is for your opponents. If purple or blue wanted to go onto this one, it would of course cost one extra coin for every token already there. So if purple went there, it would cost a priest and a coin, and then if we wanted to go there before the end of the game, it would cost a priest and two coins, making it even more costly to activate that ritual card. Finally, all players will score for the pyramids in the middle of the table. I mentioned this before, but once again, each player will get one point for every level they have in a pyramid for each of their buildings based off the specific condition of the scoring tile next to that pyramid. If the pyramid is complete, which means it has one of these small pieces on top of it, then every piece in that pyramid will be worth five extra points to the player who owns those pieces. Once we add all of that up, the player with the most victory points will be the winner, and if there is a tie, then the player who is farthest up on the sacrifice track will break the tie in their favor. Well, we're now ready for the fourth out of five rounds in the game, and we start by simultaneously selecting a card from our hand. Out of our five cards, we have two of them that are restricted to this area, where, strangely enough, no one has actually constructed just yet. We have one for forest and one for plains. Now, plains is also a uh, terrain type that's been barely built in, and we do still want to keep building over here because of this pyramid scoring. So I think let's go with this one so that we could potentially build over here, and if that doesn't end up working out, we could build into other plain spots because there's quite a few of those left around the board. So this will be the card that we select. Well, everyone's made their decision. Purple went with 26, orange went with 18, and we went with 16. So that means, once again, we actually get to go first. Let's start things off with income, and we are certainly going to be running this instead of that. So we are going to get two stone, two bricks, one priest, and two coins. We can add all of that into our area, and now take some capital actions. 
For the first one, I think let's spend a priest in order to perform our first ritual. That means we can put one of these tokens down next to a ritual card. Now we can do this because we have a pyramid over here and we have no ritual started. Remember, you can't have more rituals than you have pyramid tokens unless you get a free ritual from this bonus right over here. Now, if we went here, there's already one token, so we'd have to spend one coin for that. But if we went to either of the other ones, we don't spend an extra coin. And I think this is the one we want to go to. That is going to make all of our trade tiles worth points equal to their level at the end of the game. So we can spend our priest for that. And at this moment, we have two level one trade tiles. So that's currently getting us two points. And now I think let's get some more trade tiles because obviously we're going to get extra points for those and we have these coins ready for us. Now we are at this point on the sacrifice track, which means we can buy level two trade tiles for one coin less. And I think we want to do that. So let's spend one coin. And the one I think I want is this. That lets us turn a stone into a priest. And we currently don't have any more priests and we have three stone. So we could potentially use this to get a priest on this turn and then maybe start another pyramid piece. After that, we have one coin left, and remember, you cannot purchase more than one tile from the same row out here. Now, I do think we should spend this, and with it, we could buy a level one trade tile. And I think we want this one, which will immediately get us a brick and a stone. We can just take those right now and then flip this over. We can add all of this to our area and now use this. That will spend one of our stone, and it will turn into a priest. And then I think let's build another pyramid piece. That's going to cost a priest as well as a wood, a stone, and a brick. Now, if we started a new pyramid with this, our largest piece would be one of these middles. And of course, we can stack on top of one of the pyramids that's already out there. If we stack on this pyramid, we'd get one point for every one of our buildings in this region, and that's currently two. If we stack on top of our pyramid over here, that would get us another point for every one of our buildings in this region, and there are currently three. Now, another thing that we could do is start that new one over here. If we did that, it would be a middle piece, and it would only take one more piece to actually cap it off. And remember, if a pyramid is capped off and completed, every piece is worth five more points. So I think with that in mind, let's actually start a third pyramid, and this is going to be the final pyramid of the game. We can put this right out here because, again, it is currently our largest piece, and then we have to place one of these out. Now, we can see that currently we have one building in all of the forest, and we have one on the plains. But on this turn, I think we are going to build two more on the plains, so that will get us up to three, and that is going to make this, I think, the better pick for us. So we'll put that there, and at the end of the game, this pyramid piece is going to be worth one point for every building out here on the plains. Now, at this point, no more pyramids can be constructed, so we can disregard this other tile right over here. Now that we have two pyramid pieces and just one ritual, we could do another ritual. However, we don't actually have any more priests. So I think we are very likely to do that in the next round of the game, which is going to be the final round of the game. Well, I think we're done with capital actions, and now we can build, and I think let's just build two temples. That is the current bonus, as you can see out here, and temples cost a stone and a brick, and we have two stone and two bricks, so we've set ourselves up well for that. I did contemplate putting our palace out, which counts as two. Uh, this counting as two buildings for a cost of three resources instead of four resources for one of these is nice, but on this turn, it seemed like we'd be a little bit more efficient just going for the two temples. So we can spend these two and place our first temple out, and of course it must go down onto the plains. Obviously, I would love to build a temple over here in these plains, but there are no more plain locations. So with that in mind, if we look out, we can see there aren't any plain locations in that region either, but there are two over here. So I think we're going to build both of these this round, and the first one we'll take is this one right here. We have to put this down onto our board, and I think we'll cover up that coin. And now let's construct another temple. Since we have to build into plains, the only option available to us is this one right over here. We can now add this to our income board, and I think we'll cover up this spot so that we can get another corn. All right, that has finished our construction, so now we can score for the bonus card. And once again, that is going to score off of temples. We can look over here and very easily see that we have four temples, so that is going to get us eight victory points, bringing us from 15 up to 23. The final thing we have to do is take a card, and I think we'll take this one right here. That leaves a plains as well as two of these Meatla region cards out here, and we are already pretty well set to score lots of points from those in the next round of the game. So we can put that into our hand, and now it's time for the orange player to take their turn. They of course start things off with income, and they have a wood showing here, so they are going to go for this row, and that will get them a wood, a brick, a priest, a stone, and a coin. They can add all of this stuff to their area. And now they're going to use this trade tile to turn one wood into two corn. They can place this into the supply. And now they have three corn in their area. Now they can perform capital actions, although before they do that, this uh, trade market does have to be refreshed. 
This tile is going to give a wood and a corn, and this level two tile lets you turn one wood into two stone once per round. The first one they're going to go with is spending a coin in order to take a level one trade tile. They've decided they want this one. That's going to get them a corn and a wood immediately. And now they will use their priest to sacrifice four of their corn tokens. This means they will go up four times on this track. The first one means they can now spend one coin less when they take a level two trade tile. The second one is going to get them two victory points immediately. The third step is going to get them one basic resource of their choice. And they've decided to take a stone. And the final bump on this track means they now pay two less coins to take these level three trade tiles. Unfortunately for them, they don't have any more coins. If they had just one more, they could have purchased one of those on this turn. Well, let's finish their capital actions, so now they can construct. And they want to start with a cornfield. That is going to cost a stone as well as a wood. And their action card says they must construct this cornfield onto forest terrain. Currently, there are three options for that, and they are certainly going to go up here. Remember, they are going to get a point for this pyramid for every building in this area. And it's also worth pointing out that Orange has three different building types within the same region, and that is going to give them six victory points every time they do that, based off of this ritual card that they placed onto earlier in the game. So that's one extra point for this pyramid, and six extra points for that, so as of this moment, that is a seven-point move. They have to place this onto their board, and they're going to put it right over there. After that, they've decided they are going to build the first palace of the game. Remember, these are going to cost one of each of the three basic resources, and they have to build this down within their restriction, so it must be built into a forest. And they've decided to build into this forest, and specifically onto this spot, in order to place that palace down onto a temple location. They have to put one of their houses down on top of it, and then of course this flips over and they can place it right over there to show that their palace is a temple. And remember, the palaces count as two for whatever that is. So this counts as two temples, and it also counts as two buildings in a forest terrain, and it counts as two buildings within this overall region. After that, Orange is out of all of the resources, so they are done building. Now they can score for the bonus card, and that's two points for every temple they have. We can see that they have three temples over here, and then their palace is on a temple spot, so that counts as two. So that means overall, they effectively have five of these temples, and that is going to get them 10 victory points, bringing them from 15 up to 25. Orange can finish their turn by drawing a card, and they're going to take this one. So that means no matter what, the purple player is going to be drawing a card that shows the Mitla region icon on it. Well, Orange is done, which means purple can go, although we do have to first refresh the trade tile market. Purple can start with income, and they have a brick showing. So they are going to go for this column. That will get them two stone, two brick, one corn, a coin, and one priest. They can add all of that to their area. And now they are going to spend one of their bricks in order to get two more corn. This is going to bring them up to five corn total, and they are going to use this priest to then sacrifice all five corn to move up the track five times. The first move means for the rest of the game, they get a two coin discount for the level threes, which means they effectively can pay one coin for any one of these tiles. Now they get to move up four more times. This one is going to get them three points, bringing them from 13 up to 16. Then this spot will let them take a basic resource of their choice. And they've decided to take a wood, and they still get to go up two more times. This right here says that whenever they do a ritual action, they don't have to spend the priest anymore, but they do have to have coins if other players are there already, and they also have to have pyramids built, and currently the purple player has not built any pyramids yet. Now the final bump is going to get them here, and that will get them four victory points, which brings them from 16 all the way up to 20. Next up, they've decided to spend one coin, and they're going to buy one of these level three trade tiles. They do that, of course, because they have a discount of two for those, and they would like to purchase this tile right here. That says that once per round, they can spend a single wood in order to construct any building into a forest spot, and that can ignore the restriction on the action card that they chose. They're going to place that over here, and unfortunately for them, they have two of these tiles that can be flipped once per turn, and both of them require a wood, and they only have one wood. So perhaps they planned their income not as well as they could have, but either way, they've decided to use this one. They'll spend that wood to build a building onto any forced space on the board. After considering their options, they want to take this one here. Once again, they are allowed to build over there even though that does not match their restriction because that was part of the benefit of the level 3 trade tile they just used. They can place this onto their board and they will go there. That is going to get them a priest. 
and now they're going to move into the construction phase of their turn. They are going to spend this stone and this brick, and that will let them construct a temple. Now, there is only one temple left on the entire map, and it's right over here. And fortunately for the purple player, they can build there because that's part of the region that is their restriction based off of the card they chose. So they can place this right over here. And then they've decided to place that right over there on their board. At this point, they are done with construction, so now they can score for the bonus. Remember, that is for temples, and they have four of those, so they're going to get eight points. They were at 20, so that brings them up to 28, and they're now in the lead. Finally, Purple has to draw a card, and they will take this one here. So that's going to be our final bonus card for the game. We can place that right over here, and now we can build the final card market for the game. We know that because we've drawn the final one of these cards from that face-down stack. All right, it's now time for the fifth and final round of the game, and for the last time, we can now all simultaneously select one card from our hand. Before we do that, I suppose we should refresh all of these flippable trade tiles that each player has. So we have to choose one of these cards as an option, and I think we want to go for this one. It has a really nice low number, so it's possible we might go first again. I think we've gone first in every round of the game. Of course, that's not guaranteed. Someone could play a card underneath this, but I think this is pretty good for us, considering there are some good spots out here on the board in scoring regions where those village tiles are. Also, that would let us run our income for brick, and I think that's going to be good enough for us. So we can put this face down and now wait for our opponents to make their decisions. All right, we've all made our decisions. We reveal a 6. Orange played a 13, and then Purple went with a 9. So yes, we are once again going to be the first player for this round. Before we actually play, though, I just realized we do need to refresh this level 3 spot on the tile market. That says you can spend a wood in order to construct a building into the Etla region of the board once per turn. Well, we have the lowest number once again, so let's take our final turn of the game. The first thing we do is take income, and I think we'll go with this row here. That is going to get us two wood, one brick, as well as a stone, and we'll also get a corn, a priest, and a coin. After that, we can take some capital actions if we want. And I think the first thing that we should do is finish the smaller pyramid that we started. We can do that by spending one of each of the basic resources plus a priest. And then that currently has a middle piece on it. So we can put a small piece on top, which is going to finish that pyramid's construction. And by doing that, we are now going to gain one more point for every one of our buildings in the plains, which currently is three. So that's three points there. And since this pyramid is complete all the way to the top, that means each piece of that pyramid is worth five points at the end of the game. So by putting that there and completing it, we just got ourselves 10 more points, plus the three points that we currently have over here in the plains. Now it's possible one of our opponents could have completed that on their turn, but I didn't want to leave it to chance to hope that they would do that when they might try to complete one of the other pyramids instead. After that, I think we should spend a coin and then use that to buy this tile here. Remember, we do get a discount of one coin from that sacrifice track. We could put that in front of us and use it once per turn, so we could use that right now to spend our wood and to turn that into two stone. And then after that, we could spend a stone in order to gain one priest from this trade tile here. Next up, let's buy yet another trade tile. Remember, these level ones are worth one point to us at the end of the game, so I do want to focus on that. Also, we need some more resources, so we're going to choose one of these, and I wish there was a tile that gave us a wood and a brick at the same time, but that is not the case, unfortunately. So instead, let's take this tile. That is going to get us one brick as well as a corn. And then after that, I would really like to play our palace, but we are going to need a wood. Fortunately, we can get that by doing a sacrifice action. So we'll send the priest over to that track, and they are going to sacrifice three corn, which will move us up three times. The first bump will get us two points, which is certainly great to have. And then the second bump will get us one basic resource. As I said, we need a wood in order to construct our palace, so we are going to take that. And then the third bump brings us here, where we now get a two-coin discount for these level three tiles. And that would be great to get those, considering those are worth three points to us at the end of the game. But at this moment, we don't have any more coins. If we had even just one more, then we could make that happen. We have already purchased two of these tiles this turn, and yeah, having a third coin would have been great, but it seemed to me that this was the best path for our turn. Well, now that we have this wood, we have enough to construct our palace, and let's go for it. We can construct this palace onto any village spot on the board. 
and I think we certainly want to go here. That's because this is within the bonus scoring region. We also get one point for every one of our buildings over here, and this counts as two buildings, and we are going to get two points for every building in the plains, and this counts as two buildings on the plains. So this is an ideal location for us to place our palace. We can put the building on top, and then flip that over and place it right over there on our board. At this point, we are done with construction, so now we can score for this bonus. In this case, that's going to score us points for the teal meatla region, and we have one, two, three, four, five buildings because, again, the palace counts as two. So that's going to be five times two, or ten points, which is going to bring us from 26 up to 36. The final thing we could do is draw a card, although this is the fifth and final round of the game, so there's really no reason to draw any cards. The cards in our hands don't have any impact. We simply used those cards in the deck to help us count how many rounds there were. Since there are no more face-down cards, we know that this is the last round, and again, there's no reason to draw any of these cards into our hand. So our final turn of the game is done, and now the purple player can go. They're going to start with income, and they're going to go with this wood column. They are going to get two wood, one brick, one stone, as well as a coin and two priests. All of this can be added into their area, and now they can take capital actions. Before they make any decisions, though, this tile market does need to be refreshed. The first thing they are going to do is spend this wood in order to take two bricks. And then they are going to spend a brick in order to take two corn. And now they're going to spend a coin to purchase one of these market tiles. They could buy any of these tiles for just one coin, and it looks like they actually really just need wood. So with that in mind, they have decided to take this tile right here. That is going to get them a wood as well as a stone, and after that the tile is consumed. They can place those over here, and now they are going to build their first pyramid piece of the game. That's going to cost a priest as well as one of each of the basic resources. And then they are not starting a new pyramid since there aren't spaces for it. Instead, they are going to add onto a pyramid, and they are going to use this middle piece right here to do so. They have two options. They could go over here where they will get one point for every building they have in this blue Etla region. And if they went over there, they would get one point for every building they have in the teal Meatla region. Technically, they have four buildings over here right now and three over there, but they've still decided to go over here for reasons that will probably become clear soon enough. Part of it has to do with buildings, but another part is the purple player is hoping the orange player might decide to cap this off on their turn, which would complete this and make that piece that the purple player put down worth five points. If they put this over here, purple felt less confident that the orange player would cap this off, especially considering that would get us five points as well. Of course, if orange caps this off, then orange gets ten points compared to the five of purple, but the purple player still feels like this is the right call for them. Now that Purple has a Pyramid piece, they've decided to do their first ritual action of the game. Remember, they have reached or passed this spot, which means they don't even need to spend priests to do this. They do have to spend coins, though, if there are any of these tokens already on spots they want to go to. Now, they've decided to go here, which will give them one point for every step up this track that they've done, and obviously they've done a bunch of those, and there are no other tokens there, so they don't have to spend a coin, and again, they don't even need to spend the priest because of that bonus. Next up, they will do their final sacrifice action of the game. They will send their priest over here to sacrifice two food, and that means they will go up two more times on this track. When they reach this spot, that lets them immediately place a ritual token down onto any of these cards that does not already have their token. They don't have to spend anything for this, and they don't even need to have the pyramid base to support it. Now, with that in mind, they're going to place it right over here. Remember, normally they'd have to pay a coin penalty for every token over there if they did this action, but this bonus lets them put it over there without spending anything. The last step brings them there, which will give them 5 points, bringing them from 28 up to 33. After that, Purple has these resources left, and part of them wants to build another pyramid piece. They have the priest as well as each of the three different basic resources, but the problem is the pyramid piece they want to build is not allowed. That's because you are never allowed to build multiple pyramid pieces onto the same pyramid within one overall turn. That means if Purple wanted to, they could place another medium piece onto that pyramid right over there, or they could do something else with their resources. After considering it, they are not going to place this pyramid piece down. They think they could get more victory points by actually spending each of these three different basic types to place their palace down onto the board. That means they will keep these in their area. And then the palace piece that they like to construct is going to be right over here. Remember, they are restricted by their card, and that says they must go onto a village, so they are going to place it right on that spot. They will, of course, spend all of these resources, and then they can put their final building token down on top of it. That's going to count as two villages, as well as two buildings in this region, and two buildings on the plains. 
They can place this right over here to remember what their palace specifically is, and that is going to finish their turn. You'll notice they don't have many resources left, and they don't actually have any more building pieces, so even if they had resources to construct more, they don't have the pieces to place those out onto the board. So they are done constructing, which means they can now score for this round's bonus. That bonus will give two points for every building in the Teal Meat Lab region. They have four of those buildings, so that is eight points, which brings them from 33 up to 41. After that, they would normally draw a card, but again, it's the final round, so there's no reason to do that. This means Purple is done with their final turn of the game, and now the orange player can go. As always, they start by doing their income, and they're going to activate this row. This will get them a wood along with two bricks and a stone. They will also get a priest, a corn, and a coin, all from the supply. Before they take any capital actions, we do need to refresh this trade market, so that is the next tile. And then after that, they want to construct onto a pyramid. That will cost a priest as well as one of each of the basic resources, and they have decided they are going to finish this pyramid off. They can place this small piece right on top there, and after that, they are going to spend a coin, and even though they could purchase any of these tiles for just one coin, they are going to go for this one. They really want those specific resources. That is going to get them a wood as well as a stone. And then after that, they will move into construction, where they have decided they would like to construct a cornfield. Once again, that costs a wood and a stone, and they will have to place it onto a plains terrain. It looks like there are cornfields in all of the planes, and if they went here, that would get them two points due to endgame scoring, and if they went here, that would get them two points due to this bonus card. So it doesn't really matter between the two, and they figure they will head right over here. They can place that onto any of these open slots in their income grid. They're not going to be taking income anymore, so the exact position won't actually matter. At this point, these are the only resources they have left, and they don't have anything to do with them, so that's going to bring their construction phase to a close, and now they can score for the bonus. That gets them two points for every one of their buildings down here, and they have just two of them, so that will give them four points, which brings them up to 29. After that, they would normally draw a card, but again, this is the final round, so there's no reason to, and that means that this fifth round is over, and once we finish five rounds, the game is over. So, let's now go into final scoring, and the first thing we will score is the sacrifice track. The player highest up on the track will get nine points, second highest will get six, and third highest will get three, and if there's a tie like this, then the token farther down on that stack is technically higher. This means purple is in first place, so they will get nine points, which brings them from 33 all the way up to 42. Actually, purple should be over here at 50. They did get 8 points when they scored their bonus at the end of their last turn, and when I went back to fix something, I forgot to give those to them. So technically, purple should be at 50. After that, orange is in 2nd place, so they will get 6. That is going to bring them up to 35, and we are in 3rd place, so we get 3, bringing us to 39. Next up, we can score the Ritual cards. This is going to get purple one point for every step they are up on this track to a maximum of 12, and there are 12 spots on this track. So purple is going to get 12 points since they made it to the top, which increases their score up to 62. After that, orange and purple will get six points for every set of three different buildings they have within the same region, and you can score up to 18 points with this, so you could score up to three of those sets. Even though Orange placed over here early on in the game, they only made this happen once. They have three different buildings over here in that region, so that is going to get them six points, bringing them to 41. Purple went here late in the game, and they have two of these. They have three different types here and three different types over there, each within those regions. So Purple gets 12 points again, bringing them from 62 up to 74. Finally, we can score this Ritual card, which will get us up to 12 points total, and every one of our tiles will get us one point for that trade tiles level. It looks like we bought 8 levels worth of tiles over the game, so we get 8 points. And that will bring us from 39 up to 47. Finally, we can score the pyramids. This one right here is going to give the orange player 2 points for every one of their buildings within the blue Etla region. You can see that orange has 4 of those buildings, so 4 times 2 is going to be 8 points. Now this is also a complete pyramid, which means every level of this pyramid is going to be worth 5 points to the player. So in addition to those 8 points for orange, they will get 5 plus 5 or 10 more, so that is 18 points total that orange gets for this pyramid. They were at 41, so that's going to bring them up to 59. Purple can score this as well, and they have one of these levels there, so they get one point for each of their buildings within the blue Etla region. They do have their palace over here, which counts as two buildings, so that is going to be five total. Five times one is five points, which brings them from 74 up to 79. Purple is also going to get five points because they have one level in that completed pyramid, so that will take them up to 84. 
All right, now we can score this pyramid. It's not complete, and it will score us one point for every building because there's one layer. That condition is this region over here, and we have one, two, three, four, five, because this is a palace, so it counts as two. So five times one is going to be five points. That will bring us from 47 up to 52. Now, finally, we have this pyramid. We completed it because the smallest piece is on top, and we do have two levels there. So that is going to get us 10 points, bringing us up to 62, and then we will get two points for every building in the plains terrain. This is a double building because it's a palace, so we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 5 times 2 will be 10 points, bringing us from 62 up to 72. Well, after that, we are now done with final scoring, so these are the positions that we ended the game with. Purple won with 84 points, we have 72 in second place, and orange unfortunately was pretty far back here at 59 points in third place. Once again, if there was a tie, then the sacrifice track would break it, but we are pretty spread out over here, and the purple player definitely played a really good game. Now that's going to bring this three-player game to a close, and the tutorial is done as well. I hope you enjoyed learning how to play Zapotec, as well as watching this game unfold, and please, if there was any part of this game where you feel like we should have done something differently, or if there's just a part of this game that really stands out to you, then please comment down below, because I love to see that kind of feedback. Alright, that's going to bring this one to a close. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.